stand here. You don't have to go wherever. I here, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, so um, welcome to PayPal. Sorry that the pizzas are late. <laughs> um, I promise you I have it. So um, okay, I'm gonna be talking about testing, but not so much about testing. Um, it's more or less about writing code actually, and how you can structure your code and write your code in a way that it can be testable. Um, so a little bit of inf information about me for those who are curious. Um, I'm a software engineer at PayPal. Um, I do love Go among a lot of other languages. Um, PayPal hasn't been a big adopter of Go, but we are exploring things out. And for me, I work with Go a lot on the side. So, um, and I do love testing. I do love writing tests. Raise your hand if you love writing tests. Okay. I love the test. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? What is that? I love the test pass. I love the test pass. Yeah. I love the test pass. Okay. Raise your hand if you hate tests. <laughs> I hate right. Testing. Okay. You are my audience now. I used to hate testing. I hate I hate write I hated writing tests a lot. Um, but then I realized the main reason why I hated them so much is um, it's hard to do. It's so tedious. It's this, you have to do so much thing, set up your test environment, and get your tests passed. And when they pass, you're happy, right? When you um, write it in an easy way, it's easy to write, easy to visualize, <coughs> then it's, it's, it's happy. So um, I'm going to uh, show a little bit of how we can make a code easy to test so that um, you become like me, right? Um, kind of like enjoy writing tests in some ways. Um, so why do you need to write tests? Testing is not just to, to make sure that your code works. Um, of course, you, you need tests to make sure that, that whatever you're doing, whatever you're creating works. But to me, it's more important that um, if you can write good tests, which means you have, you're having good code. Testability is the ultimate measurement of good code. Um, and it's my own belief, and I'm going to try to convince you to believe the same thing. So remember the first slide we had uh, testing in Golang is just simple and elegant. The reason why it's simple is we have uh, help. Um, Go has very, very good support built in for unit testing. You have Go test, you have testing package, and coverage is very easily done. And the tools are extendable. Um, the main thing is you don't need any other tools um, for acceptance or functional or um, whatever kind of testing that you may want to do. Just need to do a new test. That's it. That's the only thing you need to do. Well, not really the only thing, but um, it's, it's the most important thing you need to do. So, um, okay, let's, let's go to an example. We have a uh, function here called verify order. Um, takes in an order ID. And what it does is that it verifies whether the order um, is valid, right? Let's say we are creating an order management system, for example. What this does, what the logic behind um, this function does, is that it's creating a connection to the database, uh, fetching the order from the database, and making sure the order exists. Um, and then create a API request to PayPal to make sure that the payment has completed. The customer has actually made the payment. Is there anything wrong with this? It's too big. It's too big, How yeah. How to test. How to test. There's no return state at the end outside of all the conditions. No. There's no return state? I'd say oh, I'm a beginner, but typically in a function for Go, don't you have to have a return statement explicit outside all the conditions? Well, really, because it's when yeah, all the really. instances are accessible. Your, your SQL connection creation is inside as well as your credentials. Yeah, that's one thing, right? Um, but the most important thing, right, is if you don't look at the implementation, you have no idea what this does behind the scene. Um, if you are tasked with writing tests for this function, you just look at the um, 
function signature as well as maybe documentation. You have no idea what you need to set up for the test. Um, and also, it's, just, it's really, really huge. That's a lot of stuff, right? <coughs> so it's not testable because you need to read the code um, in order to test it. It's not a definition of testability to me. So we can um, refactor this to use dependency injection. Because dependency injection, in terms of testability, is really your best friend here. Um, so what this refactor code does is that it takes in um, a database pointer and a pointer to paper API struct. So just based on the function signature alone, we kind of have an idea of what this function does and what this function needs in order for the test to be set up, right? Um, so the PayPal API shock has an access token outside, so which means you can, in your factory code, you just create the access token using OAuth and pass it in into the verify order function. Um, the same thing can be done for the database pointer as well. Just connect the database from outside in your main function, for example, and pass it in. So that way, if you are writing tests for this little piece of code, you know what to set up. You know that you need to set up a test database and you need to set up a, a PayPal sandbox or even a test API server using whatever tool you want. Um, so dependency is really your best friend here. But we don't just stop at that, right? Because if you think from the test, testing point of view, when you write the code and you think, um, how do I test this? I need to set up test database, I need to set up a uh, sandbox PayPal API server. Still, that's a lot of work. And all we need to test here is actually this logic, right? This is the uh, main logic of the entire function. If the order doesn't <coughs> exist in a database and the, play the payment hasn't, um, complete, hasn't been completed, then you return false. So which means for this um, logic, you need to set up four test cases, right? Because it's an end statement. Um, true, 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 false, false, true, false, false. Um, and for each test case, you have to connect your database, <coughs> you have to connect your PayPal API, and you have to put stuff in your database and, and the sandbox to um, set up your test scenario. And again, that's a lot of work. And in testing, it's just, you really need to know what you want to test and how you can achieve that. So over here, instead of passing um, and, uh, a pointer to the database object and a pointer to a PayPal API struct, we just create two interfaces to wrap around them. So um, a fetcher interface that has a fetch order <coughs> method that takes an order from the database. Um, and then the same thing for PayPal API, it can verify the payment. So in your function now, all you need to do is to take in the fetcher and, the, and an API object of structs that implement the two interfaces I just created. And now the function is really, really simple. It went from this to this. And it's a lot more readable, a lot more maintainable in the long term. So if you go back and think about it, right, if you just write code and make it work, of course it will work. But if you just think a little bit further and think about how you can write tests for the code afterwards, then you realize your code has a lot of issues. Um, and coming from a testability point of view, you can really force your code to be um, well organized and testable. So the test looks something like this. Um, I'm not going to go into detail, but mainly in your um, test case, just create the mocks that you want, um, and also um, make the functions, the, the, met the methods return data that you want to set up for your test scenario. It's, it's very simple. So if you're using, um, raise your hand if you're a dynamic language person. Yeah. If you're using a dynamic language, right, like Ruby <coughs> or Python or JavaScript, this is not necessary at all. Um, you can monkey patch your your object, so if you go back here, 
and this is probably that. That's, that's it. Um, you tend not to go further because in dynamic languages, you can just monkey patch this DB um, with this query method <coughs> that you know, when it sees this query, it should return something. Um, but we don't want that because it's really just using the functionality of the language to hack around your pro the problem in your code. And in, in Go and in static languages, um, you, you're forced to really structure and organize. And so coming from a testability point of view, um, if your code is testable, which means it's organized. And by, by testability, I, I don't mean monkey patching everything. I mean creating interfaces, creating um, wrappers and, and packages and structs that can help you like, test it very easily. So interfaces are your second best friend. Remember the dependency injection is your first best friend. And now we have interfaces. And they always go side by side. Um, if you are writing code in Go or in Java and C++, and you don't have those things, which means your code are not testable. Um, so interfaces are really powerful, right? And in Go, especially, if you, are, if you want to make your code testable, interfaces are not um, avoidable at all. So take this for example. <coughs> in the net HTTP package, we have a response writer, which is an interface. Um, it has all these methods, which means in your test, if you're writing a, a web app in Go, you don't need to create an entire server and uh, make real HTTP requests. You can just mock this response writer, um, create a write header method that does whatever you want to do. Without this interface, it's not possible. And this is exactly what the HTTP test package does, um, making use of the interface to make tests a much, much, more easy, uh, much more easily for you. Another thing, another example is the Redis package that has this con interface. Um, so you don't have to make a real Redis connection, just uh, create a mock connection that can, for example, override the do method and returns the data that you want to set up in your test scenario. It's very powerful. So um, I think uh, Jonathan's going to talk more about interfaces later. So. Um, but my philosophy is, you know, interfaces are also kind of evil. Um, I don't like having too many interfaces, especially in Go, it's very hard to keep track because you cannot de de declare um, your struct to implement an interface. They just do it automatically. So I try not to use interfaces too much. Um, so the rule of thumb is if you have um, external dependencies like the database or PayPal API, or any component that makes your code hard to test, um, just think about how you can test your code later, right? And there, there's, a, there's this component that makes it really, really hard to test. So which probably means you need to wrap around it with an interface or an adapter, for example, whatever you want to call it. Um, so yeah. Uh, the whole point in this talk I'm trying to make is testability equals good code. And if, you're, if you hate testing, then you should really, really rethink about how you write your code because it really just means that your code is bad. Um, so another example to prove the point is, um, let's say we have this, this function called reship. <coughs> And um, it makes use of the verify order function that we just created before. So um, in this function, we create a DB and PayPal API using access token, using OAuth. Um, it works, right? But again, if you just write this and you don't think about how you can test it later, um, you won't make it uh, maintainable in the long run. So if you think about how you can test this later, you probably will think, um, I need to set up a test database. Again, I need to set up paper sandbox API as well. And it's still a pain in the ass. And all I need to test is actually just this, this if else statement. So um, we can do the same thing as before, right? Um, passing the fetcher and the API to the reshift function, and then pass them through to verify order. But it's really unnecessary 
we, we are just passing things around um, and we can do much better than that. So in this scenario, coming from testing point of view again, we can create a uh, manager struct that holds the dependencies. So now this dependency injection is a lot easier using this common struct. And um, reship and verify order are the two methods under that struct. So they have access to the same dependencies. Um, and now the code is a lot easier to um, reason about and a lot easier to set up the test, right? Um, okay. So, which means coming from the testing point of view, um, we have made our code more organized and more structured. <coughs> so what about integration testing, right? Um, there's no magic in the integration testing in Go. Uh, unit testing, again, is the most important thing that you have to do first. It's much better to have um, good unit test coverage than having integration test coverage. But still, integration test is important because if um, you test the components independently, um, there's no guarantee that they'll work together, right? So integration test, um, there's, there's no magic. You just have to do it for real. No mocking is allowed, I think. Um, I expect it to be slow because you don't have uh, mocking. You have to set up your real, real environment here and your test can run for hours. So um, it's better to build to use a specific build tag, um, mark it as an integration test, and then go test tax integration. You will just run all of your integration tests. And when you run go test normally, you just run the unit test. So your go test command can be put in as a pre-commit hook or anything, but integration test should be handled by the U, uh, by the CI. Um, and in and in integration testing coverage matters. In unit testing, coverage doesn't mean anything at all. <coughs> if you have 100% coverage, but your code hasn't um, fully covered all the scenarios, and it's still the same thing. But in integration tests, um, if the more coverage you have, um, the more it means that uh, your tests have actually tested all of the integration of the components involved. And it can be compromised. You don't need to go through all the scenarios, all the cases, the edge cases, just go, if, if you really have to compromise on time, then compromise on integration testing. Just go through the happy path, make sure everything works okay. Um, it's like building a car, right? You build an engine, a wheel, and tires, everything. And then when you have to release to the market in a very you know, um, urgent manner for some reason, just put everything together, make sure it runs, make sure it uh, doesn't crash or something which means kind of, um, it's a high possibility that things are working correctly. Um, integration test example, I don't. Okay, so this is just to show how you can run integration test. Um, it's not much here. So I'm almost near the end actually, it's pretty short. Um, so the key takeaway here is, um, first of all, use dependency injection. It's very powerful. You cannot have testability without dependency injection. Your function um, shouldn't look for things. It shouldn't uh, create database connection. You should always ask for a database connection. Um, and then if you have any component that makes it hard to test or any external dependencies, use the interface to wrap around them. So in your unit test, you just have to create a mock um, implementation of the interface and set up in your test scenario in whatever way you want. And um, functions, methods, and go routines must have good, clear input and output. And this is very important. Um, if you have signed effects all in your function, and which means your code will do something else that the test hasn't covered. And, and that's not good, right? Because with that, there's one possibility or so. Like one single edge case that will crush everything. Um, don't let that happen should always have clear input and output, even though it means writing more code, but your code will be a lot more um, maintainable. Um, unit testing is powerful, cover everything with unit tests. If you have to compromise because of time, um, compromise on integration tests and functional tests instead of unit tests. And that's my own opinion. Um, if you disagree, I don't care. 
Um, <laughs> but keep it simple, yeah? You don't need any other fancy tools like Gingo. Um, they're, they're good, they're really good, but you don't need them to get started on testing. Just use Go test, testing package. Everything is in code, just write everything out. And I hope I've convinced you that your code is not good when it's not testable. Testability is the ultimate measurement of good code. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? When you were showing, can you go back to the reshift function? Yep. This one? Mm, this one? Before it factor. <coughs> yeah, yeah. So before it factor. So at that point, you were saying that you would not like to pass again the fetcher and the API, right? Yep. To reshift. And then you prefer to put it in a struct outside. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Do you don't you think you lose a bit of uh, readability when you do that? Because then you have to look in the struct to know which one, which uh, which element to initialize before calling the function. Oh, you, you have to do that, right? So um, <laughs> yeah, instead, but of, I mean, instead of having really uh, clear dependencies in your arguments. Yeah, so the main reason why I don't want test to pass the dependencies in here, because if you have multiple of them, then be layers on top of layers, then you, you go into the Node.js regime, if uh, callbacks after callbacks and after callbacks. Um, closure is good, closure is very good, but it makes it hard to uh, maintain and visualize all the dependencies together. You won't know that this reshift function or call verify order function with the same dependencies without looking at the code. But if you put all of uh, both of them under the same manager um, and they both have uh, the dependencies declared, then you know that um, in order to test these two functions and methods, and if they work together, you just set up one single environment with mock fetcher and mock PayPal API. That's it. What if? Uh she only needed uh, Fetcher and API and not verify other. Would you put it as an argument then? Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Anything else? Have you ever encountered cyclic dependency? Cyclic dependency for Go? Any, um, any language? Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> How do you solve it? How do you solve it? I think that they have something to figure it out for you. But for them, how do I'm not sure if you're talking about package dependencies or just um, like <coughs> these dependencies. Uh, so, pack this, yeah, yeah. Um, so if, for example, you have this manager depends on fetcher and fetcher depends on manager, yeah. well, it's, it's totally depend on how you write your code, right? So uh, if you encounter that scenario, then mm -hmm. probably your code need to be broken down. Um, or um, it, it may not make sense for Fetcher to be dependent on manager. So when you, when you encounter these things, which means that you need to rethink how you write a code. Um, package dependency, I'm, I'm not too sure about that. I'm not sure if Go handles cyclic dependency. I think it won't allow it. It won't allow it. It won't allow, right. Yeah. Yeah. Then you have to, okay, I have to do something else. Then you yeah. take things out, then put it somewhere else. Yeah. Then make sure the same thing applies to your code, right? For if example, you if you're a manager, you want to know all your fetcher. Yeah. At some time, the fetcher want to know uh, who the manager is. Then you don't how. allow that. You don't allow that at all. If you, don't, <coughs> if you apply the same method, you don't allow cyclic dependency, then your code will not have cyclic dependency. But I, I'm a fetcher. I want to know the manager. So how do I? You fetch it, you want to know the manager. You have to pass it from outside. To them or then in the same, same package. But if you want to create an interface for the manager, then you refer to that interface inside Yeah, the so if, if you want to know about anything, in, like the fetcher wants to know about manager, you ask for it. Remember what I said here? Ask for things, don't look for things. Your, your fetcher shouldn't look for the manager. You should just ask for it, and someone else will, will provide it. Your factory or whatever the the code, yeah. So factories, 
are unavoidable, for sure, in this case. You, you, don't, you cannot hit on factories. Thanks, thanks a lot for the talk. I'm, I'm very new to Go, um, mm -hmm. but one of the things that I kind of been looking for is a tool around debugging. And just wondering what, what you do in terms of debugging with Go at the moment. Is it GDB or is it inline? Or do you have any advice for um, GDB is good. Topic, sorry, but <laughs> GDB is good, but I think uh, other people will know more about that. Does anyone have any favorite debugging tool in Go? I, I, I know that debugging is still a like very, very <laughs> pain point. The log package. Yeah, log package, yeah, for sure. Printing and um, debugging is still a very hot topic in Go right now. Actually, usually when you look at the stack trace, right, you'll see which line is a problem, and you can just throw a print line there and see what happens. Yeah, it's just, just for putting in watches and stuff. Like that. Maybe yeah, my workflow is not right. Right now, I don't think there are tools for that yet other than GDB, yeah. but GDB is not using the Go compiler, right? So it's two different things. So, but you have the PPROF, which you can actually see whether you know, you make too many more routines and they are out of line or something. Yeah, I mean, there are other ways, but there's no real debug yet. Thank you. Usually, if you do testing, right, you <coughs> have a less need for debug. Yeah, no, it's just a <laughs> Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Pizzas are here. Yeah. Yeah. All right, that's it. Thank you.